Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to the iCar Repairs Realm. Today, we're going to be talking a little bit about electronic controlled steering systems. And yeah, this is the next in a series that we've, we've got here where we're talking, we started with electronic uh, suspension and some of those, uh, those new suspension systems. Uh, we've got steering assist, electronic assist, and then we'll go into steering angle sensors uh, for the last in this series. But, you know, we talk about all the things that we have in the new technology these vehicles and you get into the electronic assist and now we've got the variable steering right you get it different speeds it changes the way that the, the steering reacts when to the input on the steering wheel all the different things that we have on those systems right so if we think about the collision world and how the the electronic steering systems have impact or could potentially impact the collision repair you know what are some of the things we should be looking for yeah, good question. Um, <laughs> we have to look at a lot of things. So first of all, what I want to point out is before we go into the collision specific um, things, what we want to show you, and we will go over to a vehicle where we where we dive deeper in into different subjects. But the number one thing is this electromechanical steering rack is already a vehicle since I know since 2002, yep. 2003, 2004. So this is nothing new. This is already close to 20 years old technology and established in a lot of vehicles. So it's nothing new, but it's still, we need still to talk about it. For all those new vehicles would come out with lane assists and we're talking about step-by-step -step going to autonomous driving. This steering rack is the key for enabling all those functions. So that is, has to be also a little bit in our, our mind. Right. So um, we want to go a little bit about programming, why you have to program and, and, and really, really other things. And I want to bring Jeff in this conversation. Jeff, so when, when, when we get in here, when we go over to this car, I, the, the functions of an electromechanical steering rack is in my opinion so impressive. What is for you like the key the key points on so, the rag? You know, in in my experience with working on the vehicles, you know, it's f from a collision repair perspective, you know, okay, rack's damaged. I pull it out. First thing, I'm not getting greasy with all the yeah, oil, power steering fluid and everything oil, yeah, else. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's a clean install. No um, but but the, <laughs> but the the other side of it is, you know, when I put it in. And again, for me as the technician, perhaps just doing that basic mechanical operation, I put it in and, you know, realizing that there's other things that probably need to be done. Uh -huh. um, before we get too deep into that, you know, I, I think fundamentally it's important to understand some of the things that we don't think about as technicians. And that's where some of our conversations, and we'll, we'll continue those over at the vehicle, uh, some of the things that you've mentioned to me, it's like, huh, never thought about that, huh, never thought about that either. But the way, the importance of how the different parts of a steering system and the suspension system tie in with yeah. all of that, yeah. so yeah. that system does operate the way it's supposed to. Um, and uh, I look forward to uh -huh. your being able to share that with, with the audience. You know, um, one, one big piece is, or well, big, yeah, we, you have a vehicle and it has like five, six, different engine configuration. That means we have a different axle load. This different axle load has to be steered. So back in the days with a hydraulic steering rack, you went to your parts catalog and you looked like, oh, six, seven, eight, nine different steering racks for one vehicle. How? Oh. So, and then there is, you know, always like, has this and V8 uh, engine has a this configuration, this, and you are selecting and right. starting yep. to, to figure out which is the right steering rack for my car. Now we have one steering rack, so easy. And possibly that steering rack is here over in this Ford Mustang. I'm sure that steering rack is in possibly five, six different other vehicles of Ford. So they're using one rack, what helps them to minimize production costs about with, with the high value. But now the key for everything is programming, programming, programming. You have to program now the right a software on it that the steering rack operates right. And <clears throat> here is original programming and original tooling really important. So you can go and can say, every steering rack comes out has one default software on it. And this default software the manufacturer is using to verify after production, the system operates really well and everything is good, the production went well. So they make that the last check. So the steering rack has one software on, 
but it is not the software what the vehicle needs, then the manufacturer, steering rack manufacturer, don't know in which vehicle it goes in the end of the day. So on the production, the end of the line production tells them the steering rack, hey, you are in a Ford Mustang with this and this configuration, and that's your, that's your software to operate. So programming is now really important that this is the right yeah, software to operate that properly as the manufacturer wants to operate. Hence the, um, the, the PMI process on this, if I replace a rack, I'm no longer <laughs> yeah, being attacked by a fly. Um, I'm no longer, uh, <laughs> no longer just pulling the rack in. I have to go through that whole PMI process. Yeah, um, yeah, great. yeah. Jeez. So, right. so you guys want to head over to the vehicle and, and give us some demo while you're over there? Oh, sure. yeah. Oh, I would love Perfect. to. Perfect. So for those of you that are, that are watching this live, if you could enter any questions that you've got into the chat window, we will answer these questions live. If you're by chance watching this in uh, playback or on demand, you can submit your questions to repairersrealm at i-car.com and we will respond to your questions. Mm -hmm. So now we'll go ahead and go over to the vehicle where Jeff and Dirk are gonna give us this demo. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's, let's check out where is the steering rack first located. Um, and um, uh, yeah, Jeff has this little handheld camera what we wanna use. So I wanna use, uh, show you first where is it and then we talk a little bit more about functions and then I wanna show you other stuff. So can we move over to the little handheld camera? And what you can see here is where Jeff is pointing into is, here's the electronics of the steering rack. And you can see two cables what power the, the steering rack and control the electric motor with power. So you see those cables are a little thing, a thicker that usually 80 amp motors, what are really, really strong to operate um, the whole system. And then we have uh, small CAN bus cables here. So, so really quick, yeah, you know, and something ahead. that uh, you've, uh, brought some information into the world of electric vehicles, and I'm not <coughs> gonna to go too far with that, mm -hmm. but the importance of connections being clean and having low resistance. Mm -hmm. um, as we service these, as, as any work is being done where this is taken yeah. apart, absolutely make sure those connections are being maintained clean, mm -hmm. no contamination or anything else. Right, right. Because at higher currents, that makes, uh, makes a big difference in the performance. So of, also when you bring up that point, in an accident, you know, connectors could be damaged. Yeah. And that they properly sealed in regards to all the water and what mm -hmm. you drive through is really, really important, absolute. Now I noticed on this one, and, mm -hmm. and I've worked around a number of different vehicles, and in many of the vehicles in the past, I would see a massive low voltage connection, meaning you know six or eight or 10 or 12 wires yeah. going into this. Yeah. We're only seeing three Two. wires on the, I'm gonna say, the communication side yeah, of this, yeah, yeah. Uh, which, is, which is rather interesting. Um, where they've evolved this to from yeah. over the years. Right. Um, and just coming in with, I'm going to say, power ground and CAN bus communication mm -hmm. and not a whole lot else going on there. Yeah. So, you know, internally, okay, we have an electric motor, we have a motor precision sensor, okay. and we have a torque sensor. So we talk about the torque sensor in a few minutes, a little bit more deeper, and we have a, a steering angle sensor, what is uh, a pos positioned somewhere else here. I, I, possibly, I think it's under the steering wheel. So that's what we need to operate at rack. So we steer, we're getting a steering application from the driver, and mm -hmm. we're getting a signal via CAN bus transferred to the steering uh, control unit here. Then we turning and twisting a torsion bar, and maybe I go over in the camera and, and I move a little bit over here, then we don't need a handheld anymore. So we, we, we need a, um, we, ah, yeah, now we are here, and I was waiting for my red light. I think, what the hell is going on? Thank you. <laughs> so how that works is we have a steering angle sensor. The driver operates the steering wheel um, the steering angle signal and the steering angle speed signal. That's two signals going and getting over the CAN bus signal here to the steering um, control model. In the same time when you steer, what you do is you're twisting a torsion bar and the torsion bar is part of the steering torque sensor. So the steering torque sensor twists a little bit and a hold sensor gives the information how strong the steering wheel. So that's response to you on the steering wheel or me on the steering wheel yeah, saying, yeah. I want to go left, I want to go right. Yeah, yeah, but you know how strong. So you'd imagine you drive on snow 
and you have a low friction between the tire and the street. Your steering torque sensor will be not twisted much, then there is low resistance. Right. Let's say we go on a racetrack with um, race tires. In the okay. summer, yep. everything is hot. The steering, when you steer, it will be really hard to steer when you're standing, for example. So the, the, the friction, the torsion bar will twist more. And okay. that's the information for this control unit, how strong to command, to command the electric the motor electric. to support. So that's basically how it works. And this software, what I was talking about at the desk, that's the software who decides, OK, how strong we have to support, then we have maybe a different weight on the steering or on the tires in the regards to the different uh, engine configurations out there. So the motors in here are uh, three-phase AC motors. Three-phase AC so motors, So essentially yeah. that the driver circuit for that's taking that DC in. Yep. Uh, the logic in there and the programming then decides, hey, based on driver input mm -hmm. and other conditions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how quickly to turn that motor yeah. and how and, much. Yeah, and th those motors, uh, they're going up to 12, 14, 15,000 RPM, so they can turn really, really fast. And they need to turn. You know, you have to think there is, there is, there should be no delay in you moving, and this is for me always the fascinating part. You're moving the steering rack, uh, right. your steering wheel, I'm sorry, and there's no delay between the command and the support. Right. And that's impressive. So you were expressing to me um, some details about uh, steering rack end points. Mm -hmm. And Ex help uh, perhaps explain that a little mm -hmm. bit uh, for our viewers. Yeah, yeah. You know what we, we you know we steer to the left. We come to our mechanical end stop. Mm -hmm. First of all, the mechanical end stop. When I would get an ADM motor support, and I steer to the left, and I say, oh, let's. I want to go and I go in this mechanical end stops. There is so much torque from this electric motor plus, you know, my strong arms that this end stop I possibly would destroy the steering rack and I don't want that. Okay. So that's the reason that the steering control unit has to know where's my left end stop, where's my right end stop. Then we want power down this procedure before we coming to this end so stop. So we don't want that motor just running up on that mechanical end stop exactly. and blam. So it actually op it actually will reverse the energy and push okay. against it that I'm not can make physically damage it. Okay. So we need for operation as well and end stop left, end stop right and we have to know where's our middle. And we have to know where's our middle is we have to actively return the steering rack back electronically. Back in the days, you know, we were cornering. I drive out of the corner, like drive left, and I want to go back to center. And what I'm doing when I'm driving, I open my hand, and my steering wheel goes automatically back to and center. And we were relying on caster balances, weight projection, yeah. to give us that return. Right. And if we had an imbalance in caster, then potentially that was that vehicle that drifted or appeared to have or seemed to have a pull. Mm -hmm. So when, when you think the caster angle, this is like, okay, this is my tire, this is the angle. And when I, when I stay here, like I steer over a big caster. A big caster has the advantage of good so driving stability, angles. good stability, mm -hmm. but it's hard to steer over this angle. So much easier, I would steer like this. But I had traditional power steering that took care of that. Yeah. So now when I steer like this with a low caster, it's like easy, quick. Right. And that's like, what like we Like older vehicles, here. before we even had power steering, they had zero to negative caster yeah. numbers to make it easy to steer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, but, you know, bad control on high speed. Yeah. Now we have an electrical controlled system, what controls that for us, so no problem anymore. And when we would, uh, when we would have a high caster, and we would steer over a high caster. We need not an 80 amps, we need possibly a 140 amps, 120 amps motor. And you go to a manufacturer and say, hey, I have the greatest steering rack in the world, but I need 120 amps from your system. <laughs> the manufacturer would say, are you crazy? <laughs> so, We've no, got you know, enough other electrical stuff on this exactly, car already. Exactly, you know yeah. how it is. You know, yeah. uh, every little voltage uh, slash right. current counts. Right. So um, that's a little bit the reason for that. but. There is, you know, the operation of that thing. And I want to give you one thing. You know, imagine, I make always the imagine, uh, I like to, to, to imagine things. So 
we're driving on the German Autobahn. You know, I love that stuff. So I drive on the German Autobahn, drive 240 kilometers per hour down a little hill. There comes a long bridge. That sounds really fast and kilometers. You know what in Germany is? So in, Ger <laughs> in Germany, before you come to the bridge, there is a wind hose, like a wind sock, a sock. I know that okay. word. I learned that word. A wind sock, which shows you where is the side wind coming in. Okay. So, okay. so cross, cross winds cross across the wind. highway. So now we, we play a game here. So 240 kilometers per hour, you see the wind shock is completely like this. Across the highway. Across. You, you've got a wind shear across the highway. Yeah, you see okay. there comes yep. wind from the right. Yep. So, okay, now we have to find out two things. Are you a real man or not? <laughs> <laughs> So what are you doing? You're going on this bridge. So the, the question is, what is your throttle doing? Are you lifting it or not? All right. So what are you doing? Depends on the car I'm in. If I'm in my cargo yeah, van, I'm lifting. Yeah, you in a Mustang like this, <laughs> come on. Okay, we stay on the throttle, okay? okay. If we go yep. over, the wind blows in the chassis, yep. and you hold your steering wheel, and your chassis is little moving. Yep. So what's happening with those systems? And that's the coolest part of everything. So in this part, your chassis is moving, your tires will take this movement, yep. and your uh, uh, tie rods taking that into the rack. So that's the tie rod, so this there's is some, the rack. There's some, so there's some vehicle dynamic feel coming back through yeah. to the rack. Yeah, coming back to the rack. So now there is a steering torque sensor, and the steering torque sensor, I can't see, is, is coming from, uh, from... So I'm the, the driver, I'm holding the steering wheel, and I'm not moving it yeah, at all. And I'm the rack. Yep, okay. So the, the torque sensor is here, and the torque sensor is right now starting to get twisted. But the I'm not doing it. But not you doing it. So communication starts in this vehicle like, hey, 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 tor uh, the torsion sensor gives a, a signal out. And the control unit says, hey, steering angle sensor, what are you doing? I'm not doing anything. I'm straight. The control unit recognized then that this force comes from the outside. And when this force is coming from the outside, then we have to do something against it. So it's making a correction for it makes that. an automatic correction. For that wind shear coming across. So now when you are a real man, <laughs> then you drive <laughs> over this bridge with 240 kilometers per hour with two fingers on the steering wheel, then your steering wheel will not move. And if I'm going over in my cargo van at a slower speed, I'm sitting here fighting it like this. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not a real man. That's the reason I would never drive with two fingers on the steering <laughs> wheel over that, over that bridge in that speed. So, but no, that's, that's really the cool part on those racks. So let's, let's go. Can we go down with the well, vehicle? Well, we will in just a moment. But okay. I want to yeah. take, take us a little bit different direction whenever we start thinking about, mm -hmm. though, what this technology then Whenever I think about, okay, if we had some suspension damage or we had a caster mm. imbalance, you know, is there a potential there that, that I make, so we'll have to go with, it's something we didn't discover, for some reason we missed it, whatever, we've got, a, we've got an issue where there's a caster imbalance. Traditionally, on a test drive, I, could, I would feel that in a traditional mm. vehicle yeah, yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. And in some cases, it wouldn't take much you know, in a caster imbalance for me to be able to feel that mm -hmm. um, as I drove the car and steered left, steered right, and looking for returnability. But from what you're telling me here, potentially I could have a caster imbalance that I might not catch. Mm -hmm. If I, it, it may compensate. That, and that's the point. Yeah, when you have a caster imbalance, that would be reacting on the torque, on the steering torque. Okay. So that means you steer to the left, and on the left side would be a completely different friction coefficient in this caster imbalance between the tire and the street, what would trigger a fault code in the steering torque sensor. So and that's dangerous. You get the steering torque sensor fault code. Yep. Uh, the message uh, could be um, uh, like, um, the signal is not clear or something like, uh, well, how they call it always. A rationality check. Or yeah, yeah. And then people think the steering torque sensor belongs to the rack. So you are thinking the first glance or first moment you see that, oh, I have to change the steering rack. I have a code here. But the code is flagged from a mechanical issue. So that's pretty, that's, uh, that's a little. So on the laptop, we yeah. have the uh, service. We actually have the uh, OEM service. Scan tool, scan tool, if you will, yeah. and we're looking at some various uh, data pids, data points, 
that are available off of, off of this vehicle, and we're not here to go through all the minutiae of it. But, uh, you know, it is interesting to be able to take and, and go in there and look at, uh, you know, steering angle alignment offset and steering wheel position, uh, steering wheel rotation speed mm -hmm. and steering angle. And there was a really interesting one here that was steering shaft torque sensor mm -hmm. number two and, and things like that, where you've got that live data that can be looked at and, and even yep. down to the amperage draw of the motor, yep, yep. you know, under under varying conditions. <clears throat> uh, of course, it's all DTC supported yep. and uh, diagnostic flow chart supported, symptom supported, et cetera, on doing diagnosis of the system. But uh, it's really intriguing. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to the part where we bring the car down now. Yeah, so can yeah move that camera a little bit. We don't want to destroy it. You're going to all my fun, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey. We've been looking for a new camera. We're looking. So <laughs> let's, let's put that camera down. So has right. Scott anything to share on the RTS side to, uh, towards that uh, when we when we putting that thing down? Yeah, so if we can go over to the uh, RTS website here. We can show the screen. So on the OEM information pages, um, we have position statements and things like that from the OEMs. And a lot of them have uh, come out with steering system position statements, um, whether it's a hydraulic steering rack or electronic steering rack, they, you know, they have some different things that they call out in the repair procedures and actual repair information. And that's really um, part of what they're coming out with these position statements for is just to highlight some of the different uh, things you have to think about and bring awareness um, to these different steering components. And if they're in an accident, when they should be replaced, what conditions they should be replaced under. But usually it goes back to some kind of um, flow chart or diagnostics before you're just throwing a rack in it. Um, but uh, if you're looking for those position statements, check out the OEM information pages and go to a position statement. And it looks right, like they're so it looks just like about we're ready. ready for our next demo, huh? Yes, yeah, I'm in the car. I hope you guys can see me. Um, yeah, uh, what I will do is I will start the vehicle and uh, I want to show you something. Look on the steering wheel and look on the tire. So now you get a little sound here from this great, uh, from this awesome vehicle. So he has to start the vehicle and he has to get the rear wheels rolling. So what you will see now, I give a little speed signal, I steer to the left and I open my hand and you can see the steering wheel will go automatically back to center. So this is now the function of the electrical uh, steering rack, so sorry, to bring the vehicle always back to center. So let me stop the engine quick. So now it's a cool sound, by the way, huh? What do you think? That's American so, um, muscle So what are we doing now? I want you, can you take off the battery? <laughs> I uh, the, 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 the minus cable of the battery. We're not taking off the whole battery. We want to disconnect it. So let me, let me have uh, Jeff quickly disconnect it. Then when Jeff disconnects, this is a typical scenario. What you have, you work on a vehicle, battery is disconnected. And so now we're reconnecting it. We're not disconnected yet. Yeah, disconnected. Jeff is you not talk the fast, fastest you talk faster guy, than I so work. let's... <laughs> Your inspiration. So remember, so maybe perspiration. While, while we're waiting for Jeff, Dirk, maybe clarify what you were doing to get that steering wheel to come back. I'm not sure that it was clear for everybody that what you were doing is uh, letting off the clutch a little bit to get the vehicle to move. And as the vehicle starts to move, the steering brings the vehicle back to center. So, you know, the vehicle is raised up in the, we have no caster influence or any, any influence um, for um, the steering rack to operate. So to do and simulate what I just did, I have to simulate a driving situation. So I need spinning tires. So that's the reason I put the first gear in. We have a manual car here. I let the clutch pedal come that my back tire spinning and then I steer to the left and the steering uh, system knows where's my center point. So I steer to the left and I steer to the left, I twisted the internal steering torque sensor. When I, le when I let the steering wheel go, in this moment, my steering torque sensor is not twisted anymore than it's not getting any, any impulse from, uh, from me as the driver. 
it goes back to center and that's the impulse or information for the steering system to say, hey, now I have to go back to center. And that would be a regular driving situation. You open your hands on the steering wheel while you're driving. You want to go center and the steering wheel will go automatically back, operated by the electric motor. And that's the biggest difference um, that the electric motor is now controlling this and not the wheel caster back in the days at hydraulic ones. Did you un uh, disconnect? Sorry, I, think the, I think the key takeaway whenever I think about this setup is that you know, it's really critical that as we're working on the suspension systems doing collision repairs that we're thorough in identifying any and all damaged parts because uh, there is potential opportunity that this system could mask something that we might have been able to feel more naturally as we were road testing a traditional system versus uh, having this technology on board that perhaps may mask certain things that, uh, you know, that we should be identifying. You want the battery reconnected now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll get the battery so, reconnected. Yep. Yeah. Give me just a moment here to tighten it up. Okay. You are reconnected. It is tight. Okay. Awesome. So what we're doing now is we have that scenario that battery was disconnected during a working process. And now I'm starting the car again and do the same thing what I did before and see what's happening now. I put my vehicle and let it drive. I steer again to the left, open my hands, and we don't have, we call it an active return. So right now the system is not initialized and I will stop the engine again. So um, now we can talk a little bit better. You broke so, my car. Uh, I broke the car, absolutely. What are we doing now, Jeff? I'm probably going to go to the scan tool, and I'm going to go to the Ford service information, and I'm going to look up the procedures for uh, getting this thing reset. Yeah, so reset, yes. That's uh, all good. Initialization. It, it's all good, what you said. We have to initialize the system. So I come to you. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm back out of this awesome car. So. Um, the reinitialization process sounds like more than it is. What we want to do is we want to verify where is my end stop on left and right, and we need a speed signal. So technically, we have only to drive the car, steer to the left, steer to the right, and give it more than five miles speed signal, and then the system is reinitialized and the system operates well. So there is not much, much to it, but the, the steering angle light is illuminated right now, it takes off automatically. And it's not that I don't trust you, but I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to go back to looking at the service information just to validate after disconnect and reconnect to the battery of uh, the uh, appropriate steps. But yep, uh, yeah. that, that makes sense. I mean, looking at what we've, what we've done here, and uh, I've never seen this perform this way, uh -huh. but I think of so many scenarios in a, in a collision shop or even a service center where you may be doing other work on the vehicle and not thinking about it, and you've gone through a battery disconnect, reconnect, and then, huh, do we just pull it out and here you go, Mr. and Mrs. Customer? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, is there something there we should be doing right before we give it yep. back to the yep. customer? So I would Very say, cool. let's give it back we to Bud over and we come back and join you at the desk. All right. Well, thanks, guys. That's a lot of great information. And, uh, you know, I think everybody probably took a little something away from this one. But, uh, again, uh, thank you for joining us here at the iCar Tech Center for this version of, or this edition of iCar Repairs Realm. And join us again next month. And uh, with the conversation then I think is steering angle sensors, am I right? Yes, sir. That's what we're going to do in December? Yep. And uh, just as a reminder, the iCar Repairs Realm will air the last Wednesday of every month at 12 p.m. Central Time. Mm -hmm. So we'll look forward to seeing you then. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye. That we have one question and it's just somebody that's trying to get a little bit of a head start on our next session of the iCar Repair Realm on Steering Angle Center. Uh, the question is just asking if we have a vehicle with an electronically controlled steering and we perform a steering 
uh, alignment, a uh, wheel alignment, do we also need to align or calibrate the steering angle sensor? And yeah, the sensor uh, will need to be calibrated in most cases. Uh, just follow vehicle maker service procedures and uh, we should be set. So again, at this point, we don't have any other questions here for every, from anybody. So uh, thanks again for joining us. I look forward to seeing you guys on the next Cyber Repairs.